All right. So I want to start with the story in part because it's, it grounds uh, it grounds me in the work that I do, and I, and I want to bring young people's voices to the table here. And so I'm going to share two quotes that come from some young people who work together over the course of two years to um, build and produce a little free library in their community um, so that they could get books and mini maker kits accessible and out in their community. And so fall, one of the young people says, some people make you feel like you can't be accomplished in life. With the little free library, I felt accomplished. The library helps kids practice reading and learn more about science. If kids live in a library desert like us, it really matters more. If we're over on the south side where I live, people would be like, that's cool. If we go over the east side, they could learn too and make a difference too. Then they could reach out to other communities and it would just keep growing and growing. Okay, and here's what her friend Samuel said about it. Well, he said many things, but this is one of the things he said. I didn't know how to do this. I didn't learn it in school. We got to help. We can make a video. We can put up a picture. We can show people how to do it. And everyone will say, wow, you are smart. And so just really quickly, I think it's important for you to know that they built this library because they wanted families in their neighborhood, which is a low-income neighborhood, to have unfettered access to STEM books and making kids so that kids could practice reading, engage in science, and make things that they needed in their life. And while they built in, produced this over two years, they spent the whole first six months um, building the initial prototype, which included researching different kind of little free libraries, researching different kind of woods and designs, sketching what this might look like, and making 3D models, and then actually building the thing, coming up with a checkout system so it would be easy and it would be free and everybody could do it and not get confused. They had to find donated materials to put in the library so that people could have things to check out. And then they ended up adding a protective door and a solar-powered light-up system so that people could see it any time of the day or night while well, it had a, um, a battery to store the, um, the solar uh, energy that it, that it gathered. And so, but to accomplish this work, they spent a lot of time in their after school club. They looked at lots of DIY videos online and they went to a few science festivals. And yet both youth who are highly successful in this project um, hit many roadblocks in terms of the traditional science pipeline. They both attended schools where they had very limited access to uh, quality STEM courses. Um, they both actually were receiving lackluster grades in schools. And as Samuel indicated in his comment, it was in out of school where he actually learned how to do this. And as Fall indicated in her comment, they had to use their blog to get the word out so other people could know how to do this too. And so I wanted to begin with this story because I think it helps us to really consider in some really concrete ways the challenge of broadening participation and the role that both informal science learning and SciComm can play in helping to um, increase broadening participation. I mean, I think everybody in this room knows this problem price problem space pretty well. It's why we're all here together. But just to remind us, you know, inequities persist for individuals from non-dominant communities leading to limited access and opportunity to pursue STEM futures, whether it be STEM careers or civic decision making. And we view this um, as the result of systemic level failures that have prevented young people and adults alike from seeing how STEM matters in their lives and from seeing how their lives are connected to science and in ways that um, value and elevate their lived experiences in the world. Yet at the same time, dominant views of broadening participation have been fairly limited. I mean, generally speaking, broadening participation means can we increase the number of people going on into STEM? Can we increase the number of people coming from underrepresented groups, whether it be people of color, girls, people with disabilities, people from low-income backgrounds? But how we think about this problem of broadening participation, whether it's how we frame that challenge space or how we think about the solutions to it, uh, really just focuses on then how do we create access to existing pathways into STEM and on increasing the number of those pathways. And the assumption behind this particular stance is that increasing access and opportunity alone is what we need to um, increase broadening participation. But 
access and opportunity are not enough, especially as we consider these social and institutional structures that Christine raised earlier. And if we can think about it this way, there are so many challenges associated with taking only an access and opportunity approach. If we're um, thinking about increasing access, are we only thinking about increasing the number of programs that are already out there that have been successful in supporting um, majority populations in getting into STEM? What about the kind of programs that might um, challenge the ways in which those dominant programs work? If we're thinking about access only, are we placing the burden for participation on individuals from non-dominant communities? Are we saying that it's not the problem may not be in the nature of the STEM programs themselves, but it's in a lack of um, funding, a lack of transportation, or a lack of awareness around the programs. These are deficit-oriented stances on what it might mean to increase access and opportunity, and we need to really challenge that. I mean, we all know in this room that ISL, informal science, and uh, SciComm can play really powerful roles in broadening participation. The average American spends 95% of their time outside of school. Even youth and children who are in school spend only 20% of their waking time in classrooms. And there are so many ways in which our lives in these out-of-school places intersect with STEM, whether it's through television, social media, the news, in our homes, in our backyards, in design spaces like after-school programs, museums and zoos and so on. Um, and it's in these spaces, in these spaces that make up the majority of time in our life where people come to see STEM as something that either is or is not useful, valued, or connected to their lives and where they want to go in their lives. And so um, on the task force, we've really uh, tried to frame this question of broadening participation from a critical lens. And we've put forth four questions that we think are really essential for the field to think about that we think push on these um, societal and social structures. Um, and I'm going to walk through each one of these questions in about a minute each. And so the first question is, why do people choose to engage in STEM? And here, we, th we think it's really important to push beyond that leaky pipeline model. One of the other models that's gained a lot of traction right now is Pathways. And it's a helpful model because it reminds us that there are many on-ramps into STEM, there are many pathways in and through STEM, there are many destinations that people might try to uh, get to with STEM. But the challenge here, even with pathways, is that it suggests that these paths are clearly marked out, that programs exist, that meet the cultural interests and locations of users. But we know from research that youth don't always have clear on-ramps onto these pathways, and that if they even do on-ramp into these pathways, they may not necessarily have any directions where they could go that value who they are and where they want to be. Um, and that the way forward is not always clearly mapped out. And sometimes that way forward can be really treacherous in asking young people to give up aspects of themselves just to engage in science. And so what we suggest, in addition to these metaphors, is to consider the power of the idea of conceptualizing participation in STEM as being around personal and community agency. And here we're talking about not asking people to bring themselves over to STEM, but thinking about the ways in which STEM can be integrated into people's lives, interests, questions, and concerns. I think that's exactly what Samuel and Fall were telling us. And so we think there are some really important questions here that can get us to think about this point from the standpoint of these social and um, institutional structures. What are the goals, for example, of your science communication activities? What outcomes do you seek in terms of changing how participants think, understand, or act? And how can you design activities and experiences so that participants have moments to talk with one another to help with their meaning making? The second question that we think is really important is how are people asked to engage with STEM? Here we're really thinking about how broadening participation needs to pay attention to how programs and experiences welcome the wide range of cultural assets that people bring to engaging in STEM. 
what we need to be thinking about here, and this is an example of a social structure, are how the dominant cultural norms of STEM reflect the history of who has participated in STEM, namely white, namely middle class, and namely male. And so, um, and then we can think about these ways of being, these ways of talking, these ways of doing science as reflecting these cultural histories. And so broadening participation then requires us to redesign public engagement, redesign these institutional structures in ways that push back against these dominant cultural norms in ways that open them up to a broader set of cultural ways of being in STEM. And so the guiding questions that we think are important here that push on this are what does successful participation in your program or organization look like? What cultural norms are valued, how, and why? Do participants have multiple and varied opportunities to use their everyday cultural knowledge and practice in your activities? And do you have guidelines for designing and evaluating your program in ways that support cultural inclusivity? Okay, so the third question is, when do critical approaches to broadening participation need to happen? And so here we're foregrounding um, whether broadening participation is on the periphery of an organization or whether it's a priority of the organization. So where does broadening participation fit into the grand scheme of things? You know, if a program or organization was not necessarily founded on principles of inclusion, it may be challenging to realign program design or to get staff to think about whether and how um, work ought to be oriented towards broadening participation. But it's, it's a challenge that I think we have to embrace. And so here we're thinking about what are your organization's main efforts to broaden participation in STEM? Are these practices led by an individual? And if so, what happens if that individual leaves your organization? How does your mission statement integrate in every sentence or goal, commitment to broadening participation? And does the language in your equity policy focus on repairing individuals, which would be the deficit view, or repairing the system? Okay, and then the last question is, when do critical approaches to broadening participation need to happen? And this last point really focuses on the importance of the broader STEM ecosystem. And so by this notion of ecosystem, we're referring to the coordinated and comprehensive efforts to create sort of seamless systems of support for people as they move um, into and across different STEM-related experiences. I mean, I think we can all agree that the lack of coordination can present many missed opportunities for people. And so if we can intentionally connect with and reinforce one another's experiences, then we might begin to build a, a, you know, a really rich um, ecosystem for people to navigate through. And I think what makes the ecosystem so powerful of a metaphor, especially for SciComm, um, is that it reminds us that learning is always a social activity. And it's through these social interactions, not necessarily through like, you know, individual cognitive gains, that we can think about the ways in which people develop the tools and the resources, the connections, the social networks they need in order to engage in STEM in ways that matter to them. And so the questions that we have here are, how does your organization contribute to your local STEM um, learning ecosystem? Do you have a systematic way of connecting with other providers so that you can broker connections across experiences? And does your program or organization work at different levels? And so we think it's across these four questions that we may begin to work collectively as a field to really reconsider broadening participation from a critical perspective and to really have some ways of um, imagining and acting uh, that capture and recreate these social and institutional structures. So thank you.